uh, uh, driven dissipative uh, quantum systems. Okay, so why are we interested in uh, driven dissipative quantum dynamics? This this is should be an obvious uh, have an obvious answer, right? So there have been many protocols in uh, the quantum information literature that call for uh, delicate engineering of the interaction between a system and its environment, and in particular. Uh, the notion that you know an environment can have you know a stabilizing effect on uh, certain you know quantum a uh, certain quantum manifold of states, for example, cat states. Um, and what I want to argue in this talk is that uh, a lot of the inspiration for many of these autonomous quantum error correction protocols have often come from uh, uh, work in the M AMO literature a long time ago. Uh, and and so exactly solvable models have been used as uh, basically inspiration for a, a lot of these this uh, uh, progress, right? So again, what what am I referring to? The, there's the obvious uh, example of a driven uh, dis dissipative care resonator, um, and here it's just um, uh, a nonlinear uh, electromagnetic mode. It has a, uh, a Hubbard interaction or a quartic. Uh, self nonlinearity, uh, two photon driving and two photon loss, right? And as we all know, uh, this system is very favorable for uh, stabilizing, uh, you know, non-trivial superpositions of, of uh, distinct classical states, right? The antipodal coherent states in this case. And it's a nice fact about the master equation that I showed you in the previous slide that uh, any uh, superposition of such coherent states is a steady state of the master equation. So we would say that this is a de decoherence-free uh, subspace, and this gives this uh, quantum memory its stability uh, property. Right. So I want to take a step back here, and I want to talk about uh, enormous theoretical activity that's happened uh, uh, studying these non-trivial uh, driven dissipative system. So again, there's this uh, two photon drive and two photon loss regime of a nonlinear mode. This regime was first uh, investigated by Carmichael and Walls in 1988. Um, there's also the original version of this problem, which was solved in 1980 uh, by Drummond and Walls in uh, Journal of Physics uh, uh, A. Um, and recently, uh, there's been a lot of very good work uh, trying to combine these two regimes and basically understand the full uh, effects of uh, competing one and two photon drive and one and two photon dissipation. I'll refer you to these uh, PRAs in the, in, in, you know, by, you know, for example, Chuti's group. Um, and the reason why this, uh, these questions are very important, not just from a theoretical perspective, is you know, maybe we're missing some non-trivial uh, steady state physics that was not uncovered uh, in the previous works that I showed. Um, and so one thing I want to do is I want to uh, look at this, take an even further step back, <laughs> and make this even more abstract, uh, and to, to, to see wh what, what do these works look like? So all of these, this work that I've mentioned. Uh, basically, you can fit it into this paradigm where you uh, have a quantum master equation and you want to find its steady state, its quantum steady state. And what these works do is they invent some sort of uh, mapping to a classical random process or a classical uh, probability distribution and, and basically look for some uh, uh, symmetry in that problem and then solve that and then map it back to the quantum problem. Uh, so the, the, the most obvious example of what I'm talking about is say you have a quantum Van der Poel oscillator, but it's in this very simple regime where you just have incoherent uh, gain and incoherent loss. Uh, you know, you would spend a few seconds looking at this master equation and you could say, oh, well, I can solve for the steady state by looking at the diagonal part of the density matrix, right? And once you look at the diagonal part of the density matrix, you have a classical system, you have a bunch of kinetic, you have, you have a kinetic equation with rates. And in fact, this kinetic equation satisfies detailed balance. And so uh, you can solve for, for the steady state that way. And then, you know, you, you solve the problem. Um, so yes, in general, this is uh, a general framework that has been used a lot and very successfully in the uh, MO literature uh, over the past few decades. Um, so 
the reason why we're focusing on this is because this is exactly how uh, typically these driven nonlinear cavity problems are solved. So if you look at the work of uh, Drummond and Walls in 1980, uh, what they did is they essentially invented a uh, very complicated uh, phase space distribution, the uh, positive P uh, phase space distribution. They mapped this quantum dynamics onto an effective uh, diffusion process, classical diffusion process in four dimensions. Okay, and why did they do that? Well, because if you do this, there's this kind of mathematical accident that happens if, with this kind of driven care problem, is that this uh, diffusion process is completely reversible at the level of trajectory. So if you looked at uh, the moments of uh, the random process in the space space, and then you looked at the moments of the reversed process, they, those moments are exactly the same uh, in the limit of, of, of a large number of trajectories. So, so this is a symmetry. And again, this leads to detailed balance. So you can solve this uh, classical diffusion process on the right. So now this kind of leads to a lot of the work that has inspired a lot of the questions in, in my PhD. And also there's you know, foundational work by Stanagel, Rommel, and Zoller that I'm also going to talk about. It's basically what we're doing now, uh, like 30 years later, 40 years later, is we're trying to find um, uh, basically a, a, a quantum man manifestation of the symmetry. So we don't want to look at these mathematical flukes. We want to look at the original Lindblad master equation. Is there some quantum symmetry that, that basically this, this classical symmetry is a symptom of, or it's, it's indicating something, right? And it turns out this, the question of finding the, the corresponding quantum symmetry is actually non-trivial. Right, because you can prove some, some sort of no-go theorem, which is basically for these driven distributive cavity problems, uh, any microscopic realization of this distributive system, so basically you're adding the environment back in, uh, must break uh, time reversal symmetry, no matter how you construct one. So you, you can prove that the steady states of these systems are sufficiently complex, that there is no conventional notion of quantum time reversal symmetry in this problem. So. What did people do? So uh, there's this very uh, good work by Shonagel, Rabel, and Zoller in New Journal of Physics 10 years ago, which basically uh, finds a quantum symmetry that, uh, that uh, is, is, is making this problem solvable. And what they do, so, so you can't look for conventional time reversal symmetry. So what they do is they look at a doubled version of the system. So they look at this very funny looking uh, purification of the steady state density matrix, which we call a thermal field double state. And this purification depends on an anti-unitary operator T, right? And basically what Schnanigal noticed uh, 10 years ago is that if you measure, if you, if you consider a thought experiment where you measure cross-site correlation functions in this doubled, in this purified steady state, then those correlation functions are time reversal symmetric. So there is a symmetry once you look at like a, basically a doubling of the system. And well, this is exactly hidden time reversal symmetry. So what we've done is we've said, okay, this is a quantum uh, symmetry. It makes the steady state problem solvable. And we call this a hidden time reversal symmetry because it does not correspond to any conventional microscopic uh, TRS. Okay. Um, so yeah, so a lot of work has followed since then. So we, we've published some, some work where we've actually used this quantum symmetry to actually extend the solvable regime of this uh, uh, space, space of nonlinear cavity models. Uh, but we've also uh, basically just proved the, the missing pieces in this whole picture. So we're putting it all together. So one, one thing that would be nice of this hidden time reversal symmetry is, well, if you have a conventional time reversal symmetry, then, it, then you better have a hidden one, right? So one fact is that, well, a hidden time reversal symmetry uh, it, yeah, it's, a, it's more general. So it's a general, it's a more abstract notion of time reversal symmetry that holds if you have conventional microscopic reversibility, but if you don't, it can still exist. For example, this class of problems. Um, another thing is, yes, this, the, 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 the kind of the, the magic in, in the positive P work from the 1980s is actually a symptom of hidden time reversal symmetry. So you can also prove another theorem that says, okay, if I have a restricted um, class of, uh, you know, multi-mode, not, not even single-mode problems. You can have a lattice model, a bosonic lattice model. And as long as those 
bosonic modes are subject to single uh, photon loss, then you can prove that any hidden time reversal symmetry of that problem uh, will, will correspond to a reversibility of, of the corresponding classical diffusion process after you map to any, any kind of generalized P representation, you know, complex P, positive P. Uh, and if you, if you have a well-defined Glauber P distribution, then that, that, that Fokker-Planck equation will also be reversible. So this is uh, basically guaranteed. You don't even have to check it. You don't have to do the mapping, right? And in fact, we actually just give a, uh, an explicit construction of the corresponding classical uh, time reversal operation uh, in the appendix of this uh, BRX quantum work. Um, so yeah, um, so that, that's already uh, published. So now what I want to do is I want to look at uh, going beyond this uh, quantum optics work and solving uh, many body systems, uh, lat lattice models, uh, using hidden time reversal symmetry. So to, 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 to inspire this model, uh, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna interest, introduce uh, an exactly solvable many body system. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna dial down the complexity of the single site problem that we're looking at, right? So we're going to look at a two photon driven uh, care resonator with single photon loss. And this is called a KPL, right? Care par parametric oscillator. Uh, also, also, you know, some people are calling it, you know, a parametron because of it's, you know, it has uh, classically bistable uh, states in, in the large driving limit. Uh, you know, you can go below and above threshold, you know, the standard theory, right? Uh, this has a Z2 symmetry. And so what we're going to introduce now is what we call a many body parametric oscillator or a large OPO. And in a large OPO, basically it's the same as a single site OPO, except the discrete Z2 symmetry of the, the oscillator, basically the reflection in, 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 in phase space is generalized to a continuous orthogonal group. So this, this model has a continuous uh, family of symmetries, and this is the model that, that we can solve. Uh, so basically, uh, there, there are two things to notice here. First of all, um, we have a global Hubbard, Bose-Hubbard interaction. We don't have a local one. So, so basically, the, the energy of, a, of, a, of an eigenstate of the system is, just depends on uh, just the total number of photons. Uh, we don't have hopping. We have kind of artificial hopping, which is uh, induced by a pair driving. And uh, we have this uh, phys more ph physically realistic loss, which is where we have uh, you know, individual Markovian loss on each mode. And interestingly enough, if the, mo if the loss rates are different, then you actually can't solve the system. So this is actually <laughs> something that, that is needed. Um, yes, and so this has a continuous symmetry corresponding to the Z2. Uh, symmetry in the in the single site problem. Um, so so let's look at the simplest non-trivial case. So so where there's no uh, lattice structure in this problem, you just have two photon driving, single photon loss, and you have a global um, Hubbard interaction. Okay. Uh, the reason why we'll, we'll focus on this is because this is actually quite reasonable to realize in a superconducting circuit. So the number of Nonlinear elements that you would need to realize this uh, uh, Lindblad ma master equation is is three. It's constant. It doesn't scale with the number of uh, with system size. Okay. So in particular, you could place uh, a, a, a chain of linear uh, mo resonators, or this could be a multi-mode resonator with in first Foster form. And uh, to to get a global Hubbard interaction, uh, you, you just put a, a transmon, or sorry, a, a Josephson junction in parallel with this. And then uh, to get the, the two photon driving, you just uh, have put a flux tunable transmon in parallel. So you just have three junctions. Uh, and and to, to increase the size of the system, you, that just corresponds to increasing the number of uh, linear modes in the chain. Um, so you might think, okay, this this sounds very trivial. You know, there's no, it just has a global Hubbard interaction coupling a bunch of uh, lossy uh, OPOs. However, the phase diagram of the system. So if you look at this system as a toy model of a, of you know driven dissipative phase transitions, actually the most interesting physics occurs when when you're not in like you know finite dimension, you know one dimension, two dimension, three dimension. Um, and in particular, one of the really interesting things about the system is uh, well. There's a non-trivial first order phase transition. And actually, because we can interpolate between the few body limit and the many body limit in this model, it's exactly solvable. Um, we can see where that phase transition is coming from. So this phase transition, here we're plotting the, uh, the average number of photons per mode 
so that's this n bar variable. It's the, it's the mean density in thermodynamics uh, la language, right? Uh, we can see that the, this phase transition is coming from discrete uh, multi-photon resonances, basically squashing together uh, as n goes to infinity. Uh, and, and just giving you a very sharp uh, discontinuous uh, uh, density slip or jumping density. Um, another interesting thing is, well, you can see that, okay, if you do Gertzwiller mean field theory, so if you do a self-consistent uh, decoupling of the, the global Hubbard interaction, uh, you're gonna get uh, basically a, a possibly tri-stable tri solutions, but the exact solution always selects one such solution. And it's actually interesting to see that, as you can see at, at moderate, uh, moderate system sizes, you have uh, like a kind of metastability of this high density solution, right? So as you increase system size, that 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 the stability of the upper branch of mean field theory basically becomes unstable, and you just drop uh, down, uh, which is kind of interesting. And we predict as n goes to infinity, you're the bi as you go to the bifurcation, uh, you're you're going to have the location of the the phase transition, um, right? So this this uh, you know, uh, resonance induced a phase transition. Well, the argument that I've shown uh, previously on the previous slide, that's, that's the physics of very low dissipation, right? L low dissipation, you have these very sharply uh, defined uh, resonances. And so when you squash them together, sure, you, you might get a first order phase transition. Um, however, uh, <laughs> is this really an artifact of the zero uh, dissipation limit, right? So one question you can ask is how robust is this phenomenon? to dissipation strength, because here, uh, the dissipation is actually 1 100th uh, of the, the Hubbard nonlinearity. So dissipation is extremely weak. Uh, and the answer is, well, it depends on the dimension, right? So in, in 0D, you have a very robust uh, phase transition that extends to a finite kappa. Uh, in 1D, you, you have, yes, it seems like this, this uh, phase transition is an asymptotic property of a kappa going to 0. Uh, in 2D, uh, you know, you can, you can conclude something different. Okay, so uh, the point is you, you can look at the dependence of the phase diagram on dimension, right? Uh, and to, to, to show that this is robust, uh, for example, you can look at um, the density susceptibility, right? So we can look at this re region where this phase transition seems to be smoothing out, and we can plot the maximum basically the derivative of, of the, the density is a function of detuning. So here, detuning could play the role of like a, a chemical potential, right? Uh, and, and you can see as you approach some finite uh, kappa, uh, critical kappa, which is greater than zero, you get a nice, you know, one over, one over X uh, uh, divergence of, of, of the susceptibility. So it's like, you can get, start to look at critical exponents, right? So Basically, yes, this is a critical point, right? This is a quantum critical point in an exactly solvable uh, system. And you can see it by, you know, solving systems of up to, you know, 16,000 uh, modes, right? Um, so, yeah, so, so and, and there's, there's another question you can ask. Again, this is all about this, the very simple um, version of this model where there's, there's a nice Josephson circuit that realizes it. Um, so it seems that there are two phases, right? If you have a first order phase transition, there's a high density phase, a low density phase, uh, then, then you have probably have two phases, right? The issue with this is that if you look at this uh, phase diagram, uh, you know, there's, there's low density here, and then there's also low density here. And so you can always continuously go from high to low density, right, in this phase diagram. So you might think that, okay, uh, you know, there, there, there's one phase and it's all connected. So in order to resolve this question, uh, you, you need to go to non-mean field information. So you have to look at basically a correlation function. And one of the correlation functions that we can compute is the density-density correlation function. So if you look at the density-density correlation function, there is no ambiguity here. So the first order phase transition actually corresponds to uh, density fluctuations becoming correlated or uh, going to be anti-correlated, right? And that notion is something that's well-defined and, and serves to distinguish the phases at, even at high dissipation where everything is smoothed out, right? Even in the crossover regime. So, so that's something that you can look at in this file. You can, you can compute any observable. Actually, um, the, the, this is something that you kind of need to understand the harmonic function theory for. So there's this beautiful theory of harmonic analysis and n dimensions and, and it, you can compute anything you want uh, in this case. 
Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, obviously there's a lot to talk about. Uh, you know, you can look at, you can see mop lobe like features in, you know, say a toroidal lattice uh, around 200 sites. Um, you, you can look at, uh, well, first of all, the, the single site version of the model. So the single site thing that inspires this model. Uh, an OP, a KPO has cat states. Well, this thing has an even better, I don't know if it's an even better cat state. It's a uh, non-locally distributed cat state. It's a multi-mode uh, cat state, uh, a pair coherent state. Um, yeah, there's there's like mode selection and competition in this model. So you could here, here we're looking at like a 1D chain where we're uh, um, increasing the the drive strength. So the ratio of drive to, to U is like almost 1,000, or sorry, it's around 300 here and you can see that there are certain modes in momentum space uh, that are being uh, pre preferentially selected at, at high uh, in the semi-classical regime. So that's that's interesting. You can also look at density correlations there. Um, there's a kind of superfluidity that emerges uh, if you do a linear stability analysis in, in, in the classical regime. Um, so so th there's a nice exotic form of superfluidity here. Uh, and yeah, so this is a toy model. So it's something that uh, is solvable. So, so it's something, it might, might be a nice uh, uh, playground to, to, to test ideas and learn something about uh, non-equilibrium quantum dynamics, right? Well, not the dynamics, the steady state. Everything is a steady state, right? Uh, and we can take a step back and, you know, we can also solve another class of systems. Uh, I've censored this because uh, we also have to publish this uh, this year, but I will be very excited to announce it uh, maybe in a couple months. Um, but yeah, there, there are multiple, this, this is not a one-off thing. You can solve multiple different kinds of many body systems. Um, so just to conclude, so what's, what's the main, uh, takeaway from this, uh, talk? Well, what we want to say is, okay, there's an old, there's an old fashioned way of doing things, right? Uh, that's been very successful, right? Uh, a lot of, uh, ammo work, you know, solving, for example, these driven dissipative care, uh, problems, uh, they, they, they basically map. Uh, Lindblad master equation to a classical master equation. A classical master equation has some form of uh, reversibility. It's solvable, and this this is used to to understand or gain insights into the quantum uh, master equation. Uh, and basically, all the models that I've talked about in this work have been solved, or, or all the results I've shown are are using a kind of a, a, a inherently quantum symmetry uh, that's hidden in the in the quantum master equation. Right, so this is independent of what we would say classical representation. This is more direct, right? Uh, and and all these models have this very peculiar um, uh, cross-site uh, correlation function symmetry. Um, yeah. So so just to conclude, um, yeah. So if we're using uh, hidden time reversal symmetry to basically enhance our understanding of existing models in quantum optics. Um, there's we've shown that there are some deep connections to like fundamental problems in uh, AMO physics, for example, making a quantum notion of what it means for a mass equation to be reversible or to have detailed balance. Um, and yeah, so we're beginning to uh, use the, these ideas to to solve uh, or uncover new um, uh, many body systems that, that can be solved. Okay. Thank you, David. So we'll take some questions now. Um, is there anybody? Yeah. Thanks a lot, David. Um, very nice talk. I was wondering if you can explain again uh, how this uh, hidden time symmetry works and wh how the doubling works. Maybe uh, I missed it, but uh, yeah, that um, might be something yeah, so we could quickly understand. Yeah, yeah, it's a. I kind of skipped over it. Uh, yeah, trying to get past the, the models here. Uh, okay, you need to use my keyboard. Um, right. Um, sorry, this is very slow. Um, That's okay. Come on. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah. So, so basically, yeah. Uh, no, it's it. It just kept on going. Uh, I put too many. Anyways, yeah. So, so hidden time reversal symmetry is. Um, God damn it. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. So, so basically the way it works is, uh, instead of, um, 
So first of all, it's a way to solve um, for the steady state of your original quantum mass equation analytically. And uh, basically the way this method works is you assume that this funny uh, cross-site correlation function symmetry exists and, it, and, and with respect to some time reversal operation T. So we saw that uh, you can define a, a funny uh, purification of the steady state density matrix, which is T dependent, right? You, so you just postulate that some T exists. If it exists, you get some, uh, basically some, some very highly constrained system of equations that basically state that this correlation function hap symmetry is enforced, right? So, so you basically what you do is you solve those equations and you get this thermal field double state. That, that's how the method works. And then, uh, then you just have to tr trace out the, the ancilla, right? Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. I just have to look it up, I think. But yeah, thanks a lot. OK, cool. Thanks. All right, we have a question. OK, let me do get this in the record. Hey, David, thanks a lot for the nice talk. Nicola Rock speaking. I'm an experimentalist, so I'm sorry if my question is completely dumb. Uh, it's regarding the your model, what you call the 0D model. So you have the, if I understood, you have only a handful of, of uh, oscillators, right? I, I think you said five or something like that. And I don't know, what I remembered from quantum phase transition is that you need to be in the thermodynamic limit, have a lot of degrees of freedom. And here you see right. that with only just, you know, few oscillators, you could see such effect. So just, yeah, can you, could you comment on that? Right, yeah, no problem. Yeah, so we're, we're the mini body, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah, so so actually, this is actually a change. So uh, there's actually a, an ellipsis here. So maybe I should emphasize that this is a, where the many body is, many body phenomena is. So there are actually N, if you have N modes in this array, then you, you have N uh, linear resonators in this chain. So, so the number of nonlinear elements is is staying constant in the thermodynamic limit. So it's it's easier to fabricate, right? Uh, but it's, you do, it is a fundamentally multi-mode uh, problem. And all the data we're showing are for like, you know, systems with, you know, 150 modes up to, you know, 16,000 modes, um, theoretically. But uh, at the experimental level, yeah, it's because there's an ellipsis here. So, so this is a chain of, of, of linear uh, modes. Does that, does that clarify yes. things? Yes, thank you. Okay. Hello, uh, could you go to the bifurcation diagram thing that's a few slides? Well, yeah, so uh, when it goes, you see the wiggles where it's going from the top one to the bottom one. Do you have any idea where those come from? Uh, no, we're just plotting some hypergeometric function and uh, we just, uh, we, we're just we also plotting the, the quantum mean field solutions and we just observe that the, quantum, the exact solution sticks to one of them, All right? Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't have any deeper insight than that. Uh, maybe it's, it's hidden in the spec special function that we're plotting, I guess. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, then let's uh, thank the speaker again. <laughs>